let's go ahead and get started. Does that sound good? Everyone ready? Yep. Wonderful. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Allison Lewis and I'm a founding member of MARC or Musicians for an Anti-Racist College. Thank you all for attending. Uh, I would especially like to thank the KU Departments of Theater and Dance, Special Education, Design, Education Administration, Physics and Astronomy, American Studies, Psychology, French slash Francophone and Italian Studies, Women, Gender and Sexuality, History, Political Science and Sociology, as well as the Graduate Student Organization Professionals for Social Justice uh, for helping to promote this series. The Lunch Lecture Series is a collaborative effort between uh, Midwest Music Research Collective and Musicians for an Anti-Racist College. Together, we hope this series will inspire new ways of knowing and spark dialogue. MMRC is a graduate student group that focuses on providing uh, opportunities or graduate student, uh, sorry, for graduate students in and out of KU. MARC is a community action group that seeks to act against racist, exploitative, and patriarchal practices while facilitating spaces for decolonial thought within music studies. Uh, if anyone here, uh, well, we're all here, but uh, <laughs> but if you're watching this um, as a recording and you are interested in joining MMRC or Mark uh, or have any questions, uh, you may contact the email I post in the chat um, uh, and I will make sure your information gets to the right person safely. Um, I'll put that in after, I guess, because I can't do it right now. Um, now, once again, thank you for attending and allow me a little bit more time to introduce our speaker. Um, our speaker today is uh, Marcus Lewis. Marcus holds a BM in jazz performance from uh, Valdosta State University uh, and an MM in trombone performance from the University of Nebraska at Omaha. Marcus currently lives in Kansas City, Missouri, where he leads his own quintet 18 piece big band. He just released Brass and Bougie. Uh, that debuted on iTunes uh, jazz charts at number two and the Billboard Contemporary Jazz Charts at number 15. Lewis also has a passion for education as he is the founder and artistic director of Future Jazz, a nonprofit dedicated to jazz education. In addition to, this, uh, to that, he is assistant teaching professor of jazz studies at the University of Missouri, Kansas City Conservatory, Conservatory of Music and Dance. Uh, Marcus has performed at venues that include the Kennedy Center uh, for Performing Arts, um, the Claypedia, uh, sorry, I definitely messed that up. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jazz Festival in 2003 and the Jimmy Carter Summer Contact Series in 2008. As a sideman, uh, he has performed at the 53rd Annual Grammy Awards, the 2010 New Orleans Jazz Fest, uh, the 2011 Glastonbury Festival, the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize Concert, and the 2012 uh, North Sea Jazz Festival, the Sydney Opera House, and for President Barack Obama um, at the White House in 2011 and 2012. Uh, television shows uh, include SNL, David Letterman, The Today Show, uh, Jules Holland, Arsenio Hall, and American Idol. Uh, Marcus was awarded the 2008 Betty Carter Jazz Residency and the 2003 Outstanding Soloist Award at the Wichita Jazz Festival. Also, he won the Charlotte Street uh, Generative Artist Award in 2018 and the 2020 UNESCO American uh, Music International Innovator Award. Uh, some notable artists uh, that Marcus has performed and or recorded with are Aretha Franklin, Prince, Janelle Monet, Bruno Mars, B.O.B., um, uh, Jadena Music, oh, okay, Music Soul Child, uh, Avery Sunshine, The Barquets, uh, Confunction, uh, Quincy Jones, and Sugarfoot's Ohio Players. Marcus is a BAC artist, endorser, and plays uh, the trombones exclusively. Uh, in addition to an active touring and recording schedule, Marcus stays busy writing, arranging, teaching, and leading uh, clinics and master classes worldwide. Uh, please remember to stay muted during the initial talk portion or unless you're ready to speak. Uh, once the talk is over, questions will be accepted either un, uh, by either unmuting or sending responses to the chat. Uh, their, talk, uh, their talk today is uh, the state of jazz education in America. Um, please welcome Marcus Lewis. Thank you, Allison, and thank you, Mark, for having me here today. Um, yeah. Um, First off, I'd like to uh, just thank uh, you guys for having me and giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I prepared to maybe talk for, you know, 35, 40 minutes and then do some questions at the end. Uh, but if you need me to talk longer, I can. Um, 
so the topic is the state of jazz education in America. And there's a lot of good things that are happening um, for jazz education. Um, but there's some things that we need to also work on. So first, I want to talk about what we are doing right. So what we're doing right in jazz education um, is that it's expanding in schools. There are more schools that have jazz bands uh, today than when I was in school, uh, you know, in the mid to late 90s. Uh, my school didn't even have a jazz band the first two years, my freshman um, and sophomore years. And so I was very sheltered and didn't know even what jazz was. Like my idea of what jazz was, was like the Lawrence Welch show on television, right? So really, again, I was so clueless. Uh, but we got a jazz band and it was more actually like a pep band um, than a jazz band in retrospect. So for me to see that now in schools, high schools in America, at least 40% of high schools have jazz bands now, um, and which if we look at choirs and concert bands, it's an upwards of 80%. So we still have a ways to go for, as far as jazz bands, but you know, it, we've made some steps in the right direction uh, with having jazz in schools. And, and, and just music in general is so important um, for young kids to just, uh, to, to work with their current education of math, reading, sciences, um, a lot of schools have done away with the arts, and the arts are actually a great complement to those subjects. Um, some just quick statistics. Uh, schools with uh, music programs um, have a 90% graduation rate. So that's really awesome. Um, and a 93% attendance rate compared to schools without music programs, only a 72% graduation rate and 84% attendance rate. So schools that have music programs have um attendance rate of 93 percent as compared to 84 percent so it's a drastic difference in just having a music program and if you have jazz uh programs jazz programs help to spark uh creativity um improvisation which are characteristics of black culture and black music that we need to address when teaching uh this music but i will get to that later um <clears throat> Okay, so I'm happy that we now have jazz bands, even in the past 10 years where jazz was just a subject where kids would meet after school. If you have a jazz band, you got to come before school or after school to do it. Now, actually, schools, some schools are implementing them as a class that you can take during school hours. Because the problem with having it before or after school, uh, transportation issues, and say you're living in a, a, a neighborhood that uh, is underserved, transportation might be an issue for you. So to even get to school before school may be a problem. Uh, <clears throat> so when I was looking at this education in America, I go to myself, why do we teach concert bands? Why is concert band so important um, to our educational system in America for instrumental music in particular? And you know, it perplexed me because it just really doesn't make any sense as far as if we're talking about America. So in America, when we think of words to describe this country or when people describe America, we talk about uh, freedom, democracy, right? We talk about how America is a melting pot, right? We have all these different people, different cultures living together. And one of the big words for me is patriotism. So we talk about patriotism, right? It's this great American thing that we're patriots and we're proud of our country. And so if we look at it as far as education, um, the music portion is taught from a lens of European culture and not American culture. So concert bands, just a brief history of concert bands started in ceremonies with military and like military ceremonies and things like that. Uh, someone was getting a promotion in the military, there was a march, you know, it's where John Philip Sousa became really popular, uh, writing marches. And that music was really only tied to that in American culture is from the military. Um, it really had nothing else to do with American culture. And then of course, out of the concert band, we have wind ensembles, which we basically had to compose music 
for this ensemble to make it relevant in American history. It wasn't like the culture naturally gravitated towards this wind ensemble. So for me, the the issue is why are we um, teaching this to our kids as a part of experiencing American culture, which concert band has a very small place in American culture. And it's simply for mil military issues. Um, <clears throat> During the 19th century, large ensembles and wind ensembles with percussion instruments were mostly of British traditions and existed mainly in the form of military band or ceremony festival location. So these are British, which are once again, European traditions, not really American uh, traditions. <clears throat> okay, so now we have the concert band. Um, and when schools do have the jazz band, we have what's called jazz ensembles which are large jazz ensembles okay consisting of you know 16 or more students um but the big band model of teaching in education is problematic because it strips away the essential cultural aspects of this music and one of the main uh, essential aspects of his music is improvisation so um you know people who study ethnomusicology and who are ethnomusicologists talk about how culture affects music and music affects culture and vice versa. But it seems like in America, when we come to talk about black music or you know black American music of any type, whether it be jazz, R&B, hip hop, or things, we tend to extract those things that are palatable and that we can extract from the culture as American and do it, but we, uh, we push to the side all of the other cultural aspects that actually matter to the culture. Um, so that's problematic when looking at jazz through a lens that's of European classical music and ensemble wise. So if you have a, a big band in a school, and of course I'm a person who has a jazz ensemble that's a big band, but my ensemble is one of the main focuses is improvisation still in a large context because that's so important, um, you know, from the blues to gospel music, right? Call and response, that's, that's essential to black American music, that, that idea of improvisation. Um, big bands focus more on ensemble playing and less on improvisation. And then only a few players get solos. So typically in a big band, um, the first chair tenor player and the second chair trumpet player mostly get all the solos. So you're teaching kids in high school about jazz, but yet only two to three of the players are only improvising. So essentially it's a concert band with a rhythm section um, it, and it really has nothing to do with the music. And so I said to myself, why is that? Well, for one reason, a big band can have more students in it, right? So because class size, we need to have class sizes to make school run efficiently because we only have a certain amount of hours in the day. So that's a way to get a bunch of kids in a room at one time and teach them music. So I understand that. But here's the kicker. Most teachers don't have the training to teach improvisation. So they just don't do it. So they go, okay, I have to have a jazz band. I know how to rehearse an ensemble and make them play to together well and have blend well and play dynamics and all these things. Um, but those things are actually really valued in Black American culture. Things that are more so valued are the feeling, the groove, improvisation, the story that you're telling through your improvisations. But we never address those things when we're teaching um, this music. <clears throat> And so jazz is not a component of a music ed degree. So how is it that in America, you can go to a university of higher learning, okay, higher learning, and you get a, a music education degree, and then you don't have to take any jazz classes. It just doesn't make sense to me, considering that if we are Americans and we're free and we're patriotic and we live in a democratic society, then how is it that we're not studying music that basically is essential to every other American art form um, after it? Um, 
So if you're getting a music education degree, I feel that the curriculum needs to be changed where you have to play in a jazz ensemble. You have to play in a combo. You have to take a semester of improvisation. You have to take a jazz history. Uh, you have to take these jazz courses because what happens um, and how we're actually failing our young, um, young kids and young students is that we get the having teachers that are not qualified to teach the subject and then they get taught it the wrong way and the value systems are way different than actually the people who invented the music the things that they value are not the same uh, so i think it's very important first of all if we're going to have jazz education in schools one of the reason uh, one of the things we need to do is that our educators need to actually have training in um jazz education and jazz topics and in particular the history of the music and how the history uh of his music affects the outcomes so jazz has always been the type of music that's been actually protest music all the political things that ha are happening in this country and jazz go hand in hand with each other if we look from the bebop era to the swing era to the 60s with civil rights movement um, and the emergence of free jazz. Um, but if you talk to someone who has a music education degree and uh, Institute of Higher Learning, they will know nothing about these things. Or if they happen to have some friends that know and had conversations maybe, but it's not taught in the curriculum and it's not valued in the curriculum because our curriculum in, um, in Institutes of Higher Learning is through a European classical lens. And so when I talk about this, most people would think, oh, like you have something against classical music. I don't, I love classical music. Some of the best composers living, Paul Hindemith is one of my favorite composers uh, in any genre of music. But if we're talking about American patriotism, then we need to actually be learning about our culture and music too. And because if we look at music through what Europeans value, the, the value system is going to be different than what, say, what African uh, Americans value or Asian Americans value or, you know, like someone may listen to an African drumming ensemble and say, uh, well, this is very repetitive and it's not harmonically complex, but that's not what that culture values. So you can't say that classical music is better than West African drumming or, you know, Chinese classical music, Indian classical music, right? You can't say one is better because we need to only value music through the value system of its culture. And that is super important. And I think that in particular with Black American music, like I said before, we tend to take all the cultural values out and we box it in a way that we can teach it through a European classical lens with things like technical ability, chord scale theory, like you play this scale over this chord or this idea over, and that's actually not how um, jazz is taught or how it's created. It's more so through an apprenticeship, apprenticeship uh, system where an elder musician is taking a young person under his wing and teaching them and allowing them to play in front of people and learning the music on the bandstand in real time. Um, so if we're going to have that model of teaching in schools, the the teachers need to give the students those cultural aspects and teach it to them in that way so that they can learn and respect the culture and um, uh, play the music in a certain way. Because if you, if you study classical music, you have to go and study all about the history. You learn all about the culture. You learn all about these things of all these composers and what was going on from the classical period to the baroque period and how the art reflected in the music and the structures of you know classical is very strict and rigid you know you learn all these things but when it comes to jazz it's just like nope um play this chord over this scale this chord is the five of two the two of five like if you talk to any jazz musicians like they're not talking in that type of language so this is why the big band model is problematic in teaching jazz only. It should be in schools, but we should also have more combos, more smaller group 
that focuses more on improvisation and less on orchestration and ensemble playing because those things really don't matter as much. <clears throat> so let's take a look at all the different periods in jazz history. And let's look at the instrumentation and the ensemble types. So jazz typically started in the early uh, 1900s with uh, Dixieland. So that's kind of like a bad term. So we now call it traditional jazz or trad jazz. Um, but Dixieland or trad jazz consisted of players from anywhere to from five to, to seven players. So a very small chamber ensemble, right? That highly focused on improvisation one person would play the melody and then the other musicians would literally improvise their accompaniments every time. So highly improvised, right? And you were considered better or not with the level that you could improvise and how creative your improvisations were. Okay, so then we move on to the swing era. Swing era, this is when big bands emerged. This is when we have all the large ensembles, Kansas City, Count Basie, right? Duke Ellington, uh, Benny Goodman, all, all of these bands, big bands. These were large ensembles. And because we had large ensembles and the music was for dancing and selling alcohol, uh, there was less improvisation because the people wanted to be able to recognize the arrangements so they knew when to dance and when to jump and when to go crazy. So, but this period was only about 10 years in jazz history. And then next is bebop. So bebop is actually a reaction to swing era. So jazz musicians really hated the swing era because this is the period where they were making the most money. Um, this is The swing era is when jazz became popular music, the most popular music in America. And the musicians actually hated that because they felt like their music was more artistic and they didn't want people dancing to it. They were creating higher art. So bebop essentially came about as showing more players being more, more virtuosos, uh, the tempos were faster, so fast that people couldn't dance to them. Um, the melodies were really angular and unrecognizable to some people, so not big band. And these were either quartets or quintets. So the most bebop, the largest ensemble you would see is five people. Cool jazz, smaller group. This was a reaction to bebop. People thought that bebop was too fast, too crazy. So jazz should be cool. All the cool people, you know, play jazz. So this was like when your beatniks came around, like that whole, you know, smoking the cigars and the, the pipes, you know, those, those guys. Uh, but this was small group, small group. I think the largest group that was recorded during that time period was an album called Birth of the Cool by Miles Davis. And that was a, a group of nine people. Um, then we had Modal Jazz. One of the most famous records of that time, Miles Davis, Kind of Blue, that record had six people on it. Um, free jazz came about as tensions were getting really high in the country racially. Um, and one of these terms we talk about as Americans and terms that we talk about today is freedom and how some people are expected freedoms and some people don't have freedoms in particular people of color, women, right? Um, and so even though America's free, some people don't feel free. So they were like, our music has to be free. So there were no boundaries in free jazz, but these groups were small, five players, right? Post Bob, um, free jazz was maybe a little too free for some people. So post Bob was kind of like free jazz, but with a little bit more structure. Um, and then you also had hard bop, which was more of a blues influence. And then we get to modern jazz or what some people call straight ahead, which is a combination of different things. Um, oh, I forgot about fusion. So jazz fusion in the seventies with technology and the immersion of electronic instruments, like electronic keyboards and synthesizers, um, electric bass. Uh, so those elements of rock and roll and jazz kind of mixed together, but still small ensembles. So we have all of these periods of jazz and only one of them primarily consists of large jazz ensembles, but we teach those in schools. So um, it just really doesn't make sense to me. I actually spend a lot of time thinking about this, like why do we do this? 
but it's because we look at it from the lens of European classical music and those traditions and those things that cultures value. All right, so now that's the first uh, thing I want to talk about uh, is the big band model and how it's problematic for education. But what are some solutions? So we can just say that this is a problem and we need to change it, but what are the actual solutions? So um, solutions, what I would say is that even if you have big bands, offer more opportunities to improvise. Um, you could even do group improvisation because uh, improvisation is a thing for kids that are young that's very difficult and they are a lot of times ashamed to improvise because improvising is such a personal thing that you have to put yourself out there. Um, and so kids need that experience. And, and particularly young girls, um, I have this story. Uh, I'll tell a quick story really quick. Um, so I was doing a master class at this middle school and I was working with their jazz band. And, uh, and so we were playing through a blues and people took solos. And then I was like, okay, you guys normally solo. Who else wants to solo? And so a couple of guys, their hands went up. And so they're soloing and it was cool. And so the whole time I'm looking in the corner and this young girl is just like staring at me. Like she wants to say something, but she's afraid. She's afraid to say something. And so I go, hey, um, I think her name was Josie. And I was like, Josie, you should, you should play a solo. How do you feel about solo? And she was like, oh, I don't know. You know, um, I just don't know. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to give you these few notes and you can play it. And whatever you do, it, you can't play a wrong note. You can't make a mistake. And so after I said, you can't make a mistake, she was like, okay, I'll do it. And so she played and it was actually really good. And for her first time, like first time improvising, that's usually not the case, but it was pretty good. And so everybody in the class clapped for her. And I was like, all right, who else wants to solo? And four other girls' hands shot up because um, they needed to see a girl do it first because, you know, jazz is a male dominated thing, you know, and, and I'll get, I'll touch more into that later. Uh, why, you know, it's problematic, but it's a male dominated thing. And that one of the girls actually wrote, her teacher gave me a letter and was like, thank you for doing that and giving me the opportunity. I just didn't know girls could solo because girls never solo. So I just never even asked to do it. So <clears throat> we definitely need more examples of, of that. Um, young, young women in jazz and examples of them doing it because people need to see examples of people that look like them doing things in order to be able to see themselves in that position. All right, so the next point I wanna talk about is um, from a cultural aspect and how we have a lack of people of color teaching in the university system, um, that's a problem. And I just wanna preface this by saying, when I say these things, people think that what I'm saying is that uh, people who are not African American can teach can teach can't teach jazz, or people who are white or whatever can't play jazz. That's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is that there are not enough representations of Black Americans and people of color in this music, and in particular in higher education, and in particularly in jazz programs. So I'm at, I'm at UMKC now, and um, there's two full-time faculty in the jazz department. That's a whole nother issue that we could get into, but that's, but I, you know, I only have an hour. So, uh, and the rest is adjunct. Um, but, and it is an anomaly that both of us are African-American. My boss is African-American and I am, of course. So uh, that's a rarity. Most jazz departments actually uh, don't really even have any African-Americans teaching at them. Because the way the education system is set up in America is that you need typically a doctorate to teach in places. So how you get a job in America is you go to school, you get a bachelor's degree, you get a master's degree, go straight through and get your doctor's degree with no performance experience at all. And then you go teach music, 
that you have no connection to the culture with. So that's highly problematic. Like, so you can get a doctorate degree and know all of these things about harmony and chord scale theory, and that's great. But that person has probably never went to a gospel church on a Sunday morning and listened to a choir sing and know what that feels like to have uh, people singing with a different value system as opposed to if it was someone who was singing in an opera or whatever. It's a different value system. Not that like gospel music is better or opera is better. It's just the value system is different. So you, you have to value those things from the culture. So, so a lot of it is that um, people with doctorates are teaching in jazz. And most of those people are unfortunately white males. Um, and I think the statistics are, and I think it's got to be lower than this, but um, in music education, 80% of the teachers are white male, and then 20% are minority. So that's like minorities include people of color and women. So it's, pre it's pretty dominated, right, by uh, white males. <clears throat> so in a culture dilemma, I always had a cultural dilemma when studying music in a higher institute of learning because things that I knew that people in my culture valued in music and in jazz weren't really being taught. We would just be like, oh, this is an amazing technical thing. So you learn this thing and then you place it whenever you see this chord. And then, you know, like we can grade you on that. So that's good. Like you can play this technical thing and that's not really what it's about. Like jazz and improvisation is about making a connection with your audience and it's a shared experience that you have to give up of yourself uh some of yourself to the audience and you will see it a lot of people and like jazz musicians like hate their audiences like you can just see it from the stage it's like this distance like between the performer and the audience and that's because of jazz education you know um uh, so people feel like jazz is like this club that you have to have a secret handshake and you know there's this like mystique about it but actually culture of values the connection with the audience so in higher education when we would bring these things up or talk about the issues that we had and typically if you're african-american and studying in a jazz studies program you're a minority and like more of a minority than you even are in america like you know I think when I was studying, um, when I was in college, my school was like 60% black, but then in the jazz department, I think there was only one other jazz studies major, you know, and, and none of the faculty was black at all, uh, but the school was 60% black. So that just, just doesn't make sense. Like the numbers don't work out. Um, so a lot of times when you're, um, an African-American and in the situation where you want to bring these things up, um, you feel alone. Um, and because other people don't value the things that you value, they kind of just push them to the side or they're uncomfortable talking about them. Uh, so, um, and like I said, it's basically what the, uh, if you look at jazz through a European classical lens, you extract the things out that you can quantify as far as like technical ability, theory, and even jazz theory is looked at under like classical theory or 20th century music theory. Um, you know, like I don't understand why jazz majors have to study figured bass. Like, it's just why? Like, it may, I, I don't understand why anybody has to study figure bass, but that's another story. I mean, it's just stuff like that we don't, you, I mean, there's like a half a percent of people that still use figure bass. Uh, but anyways, I'm getting off topic. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just disheartening to um, see that. Like, you have these values, these values are being overlooked, and when you speak out about them, you're either shunned or made to feel uncomfortable. Um, and then if you talk about it as from a faculty um, aspect, 
when we get different faculty in music education and institutes of higher learning that may be people of color, they have certain values. And, and I'm not trying to group all people of color into one thing because we're not a monolith, but like when you get in an area and you're like only one of certain type of person, it's hard to like keep those people there in those positions because of those same things. I value these things. You say you're hearing me, but you're not actually hearing me and you're pushing my values to the side. And then it's a, you're living basically in a state of trauma. So like, you know, it's important. That's why when we talk about diversity and all of these things, we need to be, look at people and what they value and what their cultures value and actually care about that. <clears throat> and so when I was in school and I would try to talk to other people about these things, you know, I just felt really alone. Um, all right. So one of the things that uh, is valued in this culture and jazz is the emotional aspect, right? Um, so what emotion are you creating? How are you able to captivate an audience? But in jazz education, what we value is if someone can play really technically well and a lot of fast, like flashy, like virtuoso type things, um, that's valued with a proper chord scale theory. And it's like, oh, like this person played this sick two five one lick. And it's like, okay, that's great, but like what were they saying? Like the your audience member or the culture that you're playing for doesn't really care about that. They care about the story and the emotional aspect, you know. Um, it was very interesting. Um, and I would say I'm actually guilty of this going through this system of, you know, this educational system. Um, it changed me and I had to take a look at myself personally um, because I started to value things that maybe weren't as valuable to the culture. So like there was this song, I'll never forget it. There was this jazz version of the song uh, by SWV and they're like a, uh, a group, all girl group, R&B group from the 90s. And so I was like, this arrangement was super complex. And so like, I'm, you know, in school and I'm like, oh, this is awesome. And like, and I knew my dad knew the song. So I'm like, play the song for my dad. And he was like, yeah, man, that's cool. But it just sounds like they took all the soul out of the, the music. And I was like, oh, like, yeah, my dad, he doesn't care if it's like advanced and there's all these cool chords and it's all these different time centers. Those are things that like we value in music education, not actually in the culture of black music. So that was kind of like eye opening for me. Um, you know, there's a professor at the University of Iowa, Damani Phillips, and he wrote a book. Um, God, I can't think of the title, but he's done extensive research in this topic as far as like um, the emotional aspects of jazz and how we've taken all of the soul out of um, this music. And um, I'll, I'll find the, the title of the book and pass it along, but it's a really great book. Um, and he talks a lot about having to experience things. Um, because this thing was like, yeah, I'm not going to fix this problem by writing a book or two. People have to actually experience these things um, on their own. So like most professors of jazz studies have probably never been in a Black community um, and experienced the culture of like, you know, going to a barbershop or like going to a church or a restaurant, right? It's like, no, I just want to extract these musical ideas from the culture and these things and be able to teach them in a certain way, but I don't want to actually do the, the groundwork and the tough work of actually seeing what these people value in the music. Because then once you have that, you will teach it from a different value system and then you'll be doing the music service and you will be respecting the culture as far as disrespecting the culture by ignoring all those aspects. So, that's what I think we do in uh, jazz education um, generally is we extract these things and then we ignore all the things that matter to the culture because we can't fit them into this box of the way that we teach things. So <clears throat> I think that's really important. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll just touch on this really quick. Um, soulful and emotive playing versus technical playing. Of course, I'm not saying that like, 
African American culture, we don't want people to be able to technically play their instrument, right? You have to have some sort level of proficiency, but playing a wrong note over a chord doesn't matter as much as if your whole story that you told. So we do all of these things where, oh, you have to play this pattern, uh, you know, uh, diatonic seven chords ascending and descending at 160 beats per minute, you know, for your jury. Like, you know, that's, that's great. That's a great way to like grades, I guess, some sort of technical thing but that's not really what the, the music is about. <clears throat> All right. Moving, oh man. All right, I'm gonna speed up because I wanna, if you guys have questions, um, I, I didn't realize it's almost one o'clock. Okay. <clears throat> so when teaching this music, the main thing that I wanna stress to um, teachers who are teaching at higher institutes of learning is that Jazz music is a product of Black culture, it's Black American music, and we have to respect that in the pedagogy and performance of the music. We can't just play music by Black composers on Black History Month and play music by women in Women's Month or whatever and think we've done the music a service, right? Like, it should just be a part of the curriculum, you know? And I would like to argue that it should be a larger part of the curriculum because it is a huge part of American culture and music. You know, from blues to gospel, jazz, jazz turned into rock and roll, right? Like, you know, so that is important. <clears throat> um, so making these culture aspects important to the performance will definitely do the music service. And just because someone is African American doesn't mean that they value the things in the culture too. Like that doesn't mean just because you're black, you're automatically, you know, given this past that you're teaching it the right way. No, you ha actually have to experience the culture and be in the culture and experience that. It's like things that you can't teach, like you can't teach or explain to someone what it's like to be in love. You have to experience that. So you have to you have to uh, you have to experience being in a musical situation of black culture and the way it feels when people are together making music and connecting um, with their audiences on a high level. That's just something that you can't describe because it may sound like I'm being vague by like explaining these emotional aspects and these things, but because it's emotional, it you have to experience it. You can only you can only experience uh, know what emotion feels like by experiencing it. You can't read a book on happiness and then know what happiness feels like. You have to experience being happy or losing a loved one. You don't know what that actually feels like until you've done it. So that's basically what I'm saying with jazz education. So we need more people of color in jazz education from studying it to being students of it. Uh, and the ones that are not African-American just need to experience the culture and teach it from that aspect, as opposed to how we learn um, just a, a musical degree from a school in trombone performance or trumpet performance or whatever, you know, it's not the same, um, you know. And once again, I'll say that none of them are better than the other, but we just have to look at them from how the cultures perceive them. Um, and so how do we get, this is the last thing I'll say, how do we get more African-American um, teachers in institutes of higher learning? How do we get more students studying, whether it be classical music or jazz music, these institutes, because the numbers are low for classical music too. It's not like this is just a problem in jazz, you know, how, how, do, how do we get that going? So it really starts from way back before these people are even in school. Um, and and I'll, I'll include women in this because yeah, it's like definitely women are at lower numbers. Um, in jazz, it's pretty bad how many women are not jazz musicians. And if they are, they're vocalists because that's what, if you're a jazz musician as a woman, it's cool and acceptable for you to be a vocalist. But if you're playing the drums, that's not it, you know? So we have to start from our public education system um, and we have to give 
these opportunities to students and kids from a very young age. If you go to school on the east side of Kansas City, your experience is very different than Blue Valley um, schools, where if we're paying schools or giving them resources by tax dollars, then that puts people that are poor at a disadvantage. So we always go, oh, these kids from these affluent neighborhoods, they have such great band programs. It's not that the band programs are great, and I'm not taking anything away from the teachers. You can have the best teacher in the world, but if you put them in a school that doesn't have working musical instruments, um, then they're not going to have a great music program. And all of the kids that are in these affluent neighborhoods can afford music lessons, private mu music lessons. So the kids are going to be better because they're able to study one-on-one -on -one with someone privately, as opposed to a kid that's just trying to figure out, hey, where's my next meal going to come from? Or, you know, or whatever, or may have to work themselves. So we need to even the playing field as far as opportunity. And I think once we start there, we will see more basically people of color and women going to school and studying um, these things and getting these degrees that are required to teach, right? Um, and having the opportunity to do so. Because right now, it's just even when schools are trying to recruit, it's tougher to get um, minorities um, into these programs. Um, and the auditions are usually better because once again, we're talking about studying privately with someone for four years versus not. Having an, a nice instrument to play versus not. Um, so I think opportunity will help. And then of course, once that happens, we need to uh, even the playing field on, um, in the hiring process at these universities because a lot of times, once again, what we value when hiring someone, so I don't know if any of you guys have been on like student committees for when you're hiring faculty and it's like what they value. Sometimes if you're a theory professor, you know, or, you know, whatever, and you're looking at someone that's coming in as a jazz person, maybe not that they have a doctorate is, uh, maybe if they have a doctorate, but look at their performance experience. I would rather study from someone who's actually done it in real life um, than someone who just went straight through school and has a doctorate and then they got to teach. Uh, so just valuing those things from the viewpoint of the culture, I think will make a huge difference. And I'm going to stop there and see if we have any questions.